Okay, again, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I introduce myself again. I'm Mirko Boschetti from the National Source Council. We work in an institute that is called IREA, is uh, the electromagnetic sensing of environment. And uh, my topic in particular is the, the exploitation of remote sensing data for agro-monitoring. And Pierre asked me to have a lecture, this two-hour lecture, together with you, uh, on these two topics. Crop nitrogen management, it is uh, extremely important, and we will see why, and uh, how to support or directly estimate crop yield. So before that all the others arrive, I was just asking if some of you has already worked in this topic. It seems that uh, a couple of guys working in nitrogen status and some other in uh, yield estimation. So it will be a two-hour lesson. So Maybe I prepared too much material, so I, I hope not to run too fast. But because it's a, a topic that is a bit separate from the other, please interrupt you, and we can go address uh, more interesting things, OK? Keeping in time for the uh, rest of the course. So let me know when, we, when, you, when you're ready. We can start slowly, OK? There will be a warm up. In the beginning, there will be a lot of graph, but we don't have to study that in detail. I just give you the, the information that you will have the material and you will uh, keep it and study it on if needed. Okay, let's start. So the, the, um, the lesson is two hours. One hour it will be more or less uh, related to crop nitrogen management and the other two is related to phenometrics and yield, yield forecast. So our three topics that are a bit separate, but are, they will be connected, in particular the other two. So phenometric information, extraction of phenological information from uh, time series of uh, remote sensing data is extremely helpful for yield forecast. Okay, so the first part is related to the crop nitrogen management. So I just add the chronometer to see if I'm in time. Okay, we will see the importance of uh, nitrogen management in agriculture, which are the, by the physiological basis for the retrieval with optical data, and then the method to estimate nitrogen. Then a really brief uh, example of application of what's going on, what can be done. One in particular where the UCL is contributing with the Belcom initiative, and the other one is a, a demonstration project we did in Italy. So the nitrogen cycle is extremely important for, for the crop. It is fundamental. The reason is that uh, nitrogen is one of the most important elements and is uh, request a large amount for, for the crop uh, grow. And uh, this, is, this is really interesting work from uh, La, La Saletta. It uh, study all the impact and the quantity of nitrogen that is provided in agriculture. And you can see that there is an increment from the 50s to up to now, to the, to the 2000, of the nitrogen that is provided to the crops, but a relative increment in yield production. Of course, was one of the reasons the, the, uh, the mineral, mineral fertilization of the increasing of yield, but the topic is that it's not always efficient the way. So the plant needs uh, a lot of nitrogen that they have to take into this from the soil, so the farmer must replenish this uh, uh, nitrogen that is uh, uptaken in order to maintain the crop production. So sustainable yield have to um, manage and to balance these two factors of uh, uh, the increasing uh, uptake of uh, nitrogen and the other unitary. So if we see the problem from another, from another point of view, in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, that is uh, the fraction of applied nitrogen that is really absorbed by the plant, the same authors, they show that there is a decrease from the 50s up to now, a flat situation in which the nitrogen use efficiency is about 40%. So it means that 60% of nitrogen that we apply in the agri-system is lost. And is lost in two main problems. One in uh, gases that have also an impact with the greenhouse gases. So it's really problematic situation. And the other in the groundwater. To give you an idea, in Europe, 20% of the European Union countries is having problem with the nitrogen pollution in the water. So this push European to have a, a law that is related, this is called the um, nitrogen uh, effect law by the environmental agency. Uh, 
what is extremely important is that uh, this balance of the uh, um, usefulness of nitrogen fertilization and the uh, externality that it provides in the environment, it was assessed by this uh, um, European Environmental Agency that is not even more convenient. So that the environmental costs are in the range of 70 to 300 to uh, 320 billion of uh, um, euro per year that overweight the direct benefit in agriculture. So this is an extremely important topic that, the, that uh, push it to create a, a directive, the UN Trade Directive, to uh, manage in the best this situation. To do that, to have a successful nitrogen management, we have to optimize the crop yield. So this is the, our topic, the farm profitability. But on the other way, we have to take into account to minimize the nitrogen loss. So the real uh, ensure sustainability, environmental sustainability. So there is a balance that we have to do because low nitrogen input will produce low yield, so low production, so not, sust not economically sustainable farming system. But on the other way, a too much high production uh, input of nitrogen can have a too bad effect. One from the agronomic point of view, that is not, who is not expert in, in agronomy doesn't think about that, the excess of nitrogen can produce problem in plant growth in terms of disease or weakness of the plants. So one of the major effects is the lodging of the plant at the, at the end of the season. That has an effect, again, negative effect on, on the farming camps. But the other one that I already mentioned is related to the environmental. So the soil and the water pollution. So what we have to do in, the, in this paradigm is the precise agriculture. We have to rationally use, with the precision farming approach, the nitrogen in terms of when it's important to provide, how much it is important to give in terms of the availability in the system, in the soil, and the plants need, and where that is the main contribution of remote sensing in order to understand which is the spatial variability and then to provide that. So we have to take into account to balance all those three uh, components. So when it can be uh, provided by the monitoring that the satellite can give us, how much if you are able to estimate which is the crop nitrogen status, and where in terms of the capacity to map the variability in, within the field. Then to act, to apply all of this, we have the variable rate technology. Again, please guys, interrupt me if any terminology or, uh, are not clear or if you have uh, any further uh, interest or doubt. So the framework of uh, the precision farming is to adopt this rate, ra um, variable rate technology. That means that now the tractor in the Western country are able to use maps and modulate the spreading of fertilizer <laughs> according to what the scientist or what the agronomist or the technician has done in terms of creating the map that, uh, that uh, um, indicated the amount of fertilizer to provide it. To do that, uh, uh, we have to base the definition of the recommendation and the user is based in general with a balance sheet that take into account the hill goal, what we want to reach. It means how many nitrogen the plants need and how many will be in the tissue at the end. The nitrogen input that we will give and an estimate of the losses. The nitrogen input is what is already in the natural teams in the soil, what arrived from uh, the crop residue of the uh, previous crop and also of the green fertilizer or from the uh, mineral uh, fertilization. So to do that, we have to create uh, variable rate maps. As I told you, these maps that can go in the tractor and uh, creating this management unit zone. So splitting the, 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 the field in area that are managed in a different way according to, to the needs and the crop characteristics. To do that, uh, we can have static information to, do that, to, to exploit, to create this map that are related to the soil properties, to historical yield of this specific map, or the preceding crops. But as you can imagine, those information are not available for everybody and needs techniques and recording system. Or else we can have seasonal information on crop status and dynamics that can go, that can arrive from round proximal sensing. Now some tractor have some system in front of them. On the go, they are working on that or of course from remote sensing measurements. So here is there where the contribution of the topic and if you, have, uh, if, if you will uh, have information how to do that. So to do that, let's start from the physiological basis. 
So anytime we wanted to retrieve a parameter, we should have, uh, say, an optical related properties. In reality, nitrogen cannot be directly uh, estimate from optical sensor in fresh biomass because the, the, the feature, the optical feature that are diagnostic for the absorption of nitrogen are in the Swiss part of the spectrum. And these are obscurate by the water content of the plant. So it means that those studies from scientists say that in dry material we can clearly see some absorption feature. But when we are in a real uh, condition, those are obscured by water characteristics. But on the other hand, we will see here from this spectra, we will see some other information that now I want to express. So this table I just give you and you will have uh, in, uh, later in your material because it's important to have all the uh, terminology. Uh, just to recap briefly, I think that the leaf array index and green leaf array index you already have an uh, idea in the previous uh, lesson, the other days. What is reported, CAB is the chlorophyll absorption and is related to the density or the, the, the quantity of chlorophyll in per square uh, per leaf surface. So the CUCAB or CCC, that means canopy chlorophyll content, is related to the multiplication to the lie from chlorophyll content. So it is expressed on the quantity of chlorophyll on the soil surface, okay, because we multiply by lie. So those are, should be something that you should already seen with the marine vice yesterday. Those are more related to nitrogen. You will find in, in literature two, two terminology wide. One is nitrogen area. It means the quantity of nitrogen that we have in the leaves. Or nitrogen mass. That is a typical agronomic terms. That is the quantity of nitrogen with respect to the quantity of dry biomass. Okay. So R is real, it means what is real in the plant. C is critical, what is uh, supposed to be the right amount that sh we should have in the plant. Then in many publications, according also to, 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 to the language of the origin of, of, the, of the authors, you, we will see dry above biomass expresses W, this means weight, or DM, dry biomass, or AGB, that means above ground biomass, okay? Then we arrive to the most important things that is, will be the topic of the discussion. The NNE, this night nutritional index. This is what we concentrate today because also in the practical we will see uh, this kind of indicator on, on real data, okay? And of course, what is of interest really for the crop status assessment and for the fertilization support is the real nitrogen uptake by the plant. So it can be called nitrogen uptake real by the plant, or critically means how much it would be, okay? Or reported from other publication as quantity of uptake or canopy nitrogen content. Okay, so you don't have to know that now, everything does, but just to add that you will have in your presentation all this terminology and will be easier when you see uh, the publication. At the end of presentation, you have also the list of, of uh, reference, so it will be easier for you to, to go in depth if you, if you need it. Okay. So, as I say before, nitrogen content is not optically discernible. And the reason is that not that the nitrogen doesn't have a, a spectral feature, but that they are obscured by water. So, what we found is that uh, it cannot be easily estimated directly, but has a nice uh, um, relation with the chlorophyll content. So, all chlorophyll-related indicator can be used as a proxy of nitrogen uh, concentration. So the bad news is that we don't have a specific feature. Let's say, okay, if we, ass if we um, assess this absorption feature, we get the nitrogen. But we have a really nice proxy that we can detect with optical data. And so this is the reason why in, in the history of, of agronomy and, and uh, field research, for instance, IRI, the International Rice Research Institute, they developed those chlorophyll uh, um, plot chart in which the farmer could take a leaf at a specific period, compare that with the color of, the, of, the, of this chart, and assess if it is in deficiency or no. This is the reason why it is related to the chlorophyll, because of the color. The greenness of the plant is related to the content of uh, nitrogen it has. More sophisticated uh, instruments are optically direct, like those meter. Okay. 
And of course, that could be done also with the spectral instrument. They are much more um, expensive and not very feasible in the field. And now those instruments are also on the tractor. So the main message from this is that we cannot uh, detect directly nitrogen. We can detect, but we see that nitrogen is related to chlorophyll, so we are happy. You see yesterday with Marine Vice that it's possible to retrieve. So this is our main topic. Here is a demonstration with the experimental data, how our SPAD or dual X instruments, you see that they are clearly related with the chlorophyll content. This is in a corn field, okay, nicely related. We see that is, there is a nice relation also for, with chlorophyll and nitrogen concentration. So fine. So if we can close the loop, we can use those instruments to directly estimate the nitrogen concentration in, in the field. So this is the tradition what agronomy did. They have this instrument, this, this pocket instrument that can go around the field. Then uh, they can, ah, maybe yesterday you had a practical in, in, in the field with the same instruments, okay? So you, you see that, no? Okay, but anyway, with those instruments you can go, you can have a sample, you can assess the status of your crop, and you already have an information on uh, nutritional status. So what is the problem? That we see that there is a relation, okay, clearly between chlorophyll and nitrogen. You see here now is gram per gram of dry matter, so it's nitrogen mass, because what, this is what the agronomy do, does. So they take the plants, they dry that, the hap, and they extract the, chlor the nitrogen with the chemical extraction. So this is the traditional what they do. So we see there is a nice correlation, but this is variable in time and according to variety. So the bad news is that one, that we, can have, we cannot have one relation that works wherever. But the nice thing is that, uh, and maybe you see already yesterday with the Marine Vice, but here from an agronomy point of view, that when we integrate the chlorophyll on lye, so it becomes like the canopy uh, chlorophyll content, and we can express on the weight of chlorophyll per hectare, in this way, hectare of, of, of our um, field, it is clearly related to the quantity of nitrogen absorbed by the plant. So the good news is that uh, if here we are much more sensible to phenological stage and variety, in this condition we are less affected. So this could be our first target that we want to address with remote sensing. And also recently, if, if, if you want to have a, a visual idea, that uh, the moving from leaf level to integral to the full canopy is an, uh, acting as a normalization factor that improve a lot this relation between nitrogen and chlorophyll concentration. So the first lesson is, okay, we, can, uh, we see that uh, chlorophyll and nitrogen are related. This is not so easy, this relation, because it's very in, in time and according to variety. But we have a nice indicator that is the cumulative chlorophyll with the, in, in, in the canopy that can be used for that. But here, we are still at the leaf level, at the, at the field level, at the dextrative level. So not yet with the indirect measurement like the remote sensing one. So if we pass to leaf level solution, we see here is a condition that we, we gave different uh, fertilization. So all those spectra that you should recognize and, have, and be being an expert on that have a difference and have information related to the nitrogen content. And we see that the majority of information are in this part, in the visible part, while on the other are less in, in the nitrogen, in the, sorry, in the near infrared one. And it shows you clearly, for instance, if we use as indicator the red edge position, that means the wavelength at which the inflection point occurs, okay, we can see there is a clear, nice relation. So this is very important because it means that with indirect measurements, indirect spectral measurement, we can detect it. But guys, we are at leaf level. So when we pass from leaf level to the canopy level, there are some problems. One of the main problems is that, and I want to give you because you find in literature, that was one that I started working on. Often, because you want to see and if this effect exists, if you want to see how powerful are the spectral information to retrieve this information, you make experiment. So often, making experiment, fertilizing a different way a crop, okay? 
And one of the main effect is that when you do a, a, a fertilization differentiate, you will see, of course, a different in chlorophyll content in the canopy, in the plant, sorry. So here is zero kilogram per hectare, and here is 120 kilogram per hectare. So you see the difference in chlorophyll content. Happy, that's what we want. We want to have different conditions to measure and to understand and to develop our algorithm. But what we see, there is much more effect in the plant development. So in summary, what does it mean? We do our experiment. We want to uh, extremely uh, differentiate the nitrogen content in the plant. But at the end, we, 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 we affect the growth of the plant. So we can have tall plant, well developed, a low plant in, in a nitrogen condition. So this can affect it. And who is driving all the information? If we see in the in the spectral information, again, I told you before, in the visible um, red edge condition is the affecting the chlorophyll content, while in the near, near infrared is more affecting the structure, the leaf area index of the plant. So why can this be a problem? Those are my experimental data that confirm that. So we gave to this different uh, amount of fertilizer, and as we expected, the well-developed plant, the green, li the green line here, has uh, a higher, the higher chlorophyll content, but also the higher fractional cover was the most developed one. And the other, the, the lower one, the, the, the red one, if you see, has the lower chlorophyll content, but also the lower fractional cover. In fact, the two parameters are correlated. But this is because we generate this variability. And one of the problem is, so when we observe, are we observing nitrogen? Are we observing chlorophyll? Or are we just observing a plant that is growing a lot? Why this is the implication? Because when we want to predict the quantity of nitrogen in the field, and we observe with satellite, okay, the risk is that we are just observing the different in biomass that can be due to, to, to different varietal uh, condition or to different growing condition, not necessary for uh, nitrogen deficiency, but for something else. What is of help is that we see that uh, spectral indices, those are spectral indices. Please, again, if, if you have, a, um, if you need a clarification, interrupt me. We can see that spectral indices that are specifically for chlorophyll and that are related to the visible and red edge position are more correlated to the chlorophyll content than, in this case, fractional cover that can be biomass or leaf area index. So it can be diagnostic. And other are, of course, like the famous NDVI or simple ration, totally dependent on chlorophyll. So those, oh, sorry, on, on, on biomass, in this case, or fractional cover. So those, those condition is uh, important because it seems that we can have splitted information, independent information to support our decision. So in conclusion from this theoretical part, and we go on the remote sensing part, in fresh biomass, we cannot see nitrogen. The, the feature is obscured by the water presence. Okay, So we could do it in the dry uh, leaves. But if we are in the dry leaves, it means that we are in the laboratory. So it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense, again, to exploit remote sensing. We want to, that quick, to do that quickly in a not destructive way, in an indirect way, in a fast way. But, but what is important that those are related to chlorophyll. So this is the, the nice things. That this uh, relation is dependent by cultivar and phenological condition. Then when we pass from leaf to canopy level, the structural parameter means the dimension of the canopy, the amount of leaves, the biomass in total, is a bit influencing more the relation and is driving more the variance of the signal we are uh, counting. But luckily, if we have the visible and the red edge position, spectral bands are diagnostic and can be used for that and in some way are independent from the uh, leaf area index and biomass. And this is what we are looking for. So the other, the other important things is in general, deficiency, nitrogen deficiency influence both chlorophyll, so the biochemistry of the leaves, and the plant development, the structure. So both those is information, we, we can use indicator together to, as a criterion for sensing nitrogen application. 
So this is the, the background. If there is no uh, question, we can pass to how the approach is to assess the nitrogen deficiency. So because at the end, what we are looking for, we are looking for maps of nitrogen deficiency. So one of the most in, uh, common and important uh, uh, method exploited in agronomy sector and then in remote sensing is uh, related to the dilution curve principle. The dilution curve principle is the following. Here we have the dry biomass of our plants, okay? Here the plant nitrogen concentration. Again, look at that. This is what I called you before nitrogen mass. So milligrams of nitrogen per grams of dry matter. So what, we, what, what the scientists uh, discover is that there is a clear when the plant develop, at the beginning the concentration of nitrogen is high, and then is diluted in time when the plant grow up. And this is fine, these are the characteristics. So we can define that there is a situation for which this, with this critical curve, if the data are in this critical curve, the situation is fine. Okay. So this is a condition in which the plant grow well and it will produce uh, the best it can in the optical potential condition of, of that particular season. But if we are in this condition in which for a certain amount of biomass, the plant is grow up to four ton tons per hectare and has not the amount of nitrogen in the plant that is uh, uh, supposed to have in ideal condition, we have shortage problem. So heal problem, the economic problem for the farmer. But on the other hand, we could have the opposite. And it's called here the luxurious consumption. So often what the farmer in the rich country, where they do, I mean, they don't want to, to have the risk to have a, a, a bad uh, season to reduce heal. So they give a lot of nitrogen. So but often those nitrogen doesn't affect the, the, the production. You have more nitrogen than what you need. And this again, as I told you before, can have an impact, an economic impact, because you spend more money than you need it in, in providing fertilization. It can have a big environmental impact in terms of water pollution and gas emission. But in particular, this is not always uh, considered. It can have an agronomic effect in terms of plant disease, increasing plant disease, susceptibility, and lodging. So, those criteria that is called the dilution curves define a, an indicator, nitrogen nitrogen index, that is able to quantify the status of the real status of the plant and in making in relation to what is supposed to be the theoretical, the optical one. So we have an indicator that it's simply saying you are in this condition, but you're supposed to be here. So it means that your indicator is below what below one, okay, or you can be above one. It means that you are, in, again, in a condition that is not optimal, but it's less critical in terms of the production, but of course not sustainable. So NNA is the ratio between the actual plant nitrogen concentration or nitrogen real percentage and critical plant nitrogen concentration. So it means nitrogen critical or percentage of that in relation to above ground biomass. So the concept can be strange, but I wanted to show you with some experimental data we had, how, what it means. Here we were in, in, in a rice field in, in Italy. So those are the day of the year. So we monitor this field. So we started from here. The, those lines that you see here with the tractor are when we give the fertilization. It's, in, in theory, there are two moments that are ideal, one at tillering and the other at the panicle initiation before the stem elongation, okay? So of course the leaf area index increase during the season and the, in this field, in this field, and the, the um, plant nitrogen concentration that we were discussing before is having a dilution. Then after the fertilization, you see that there is a, uh, an increase because the, op the objective of fertilization is exactly that, to provide the right amount of nitrogen to make it, uh, the plant growing well. If you use the um, nitrogen uh, nutritional index as indicator, you can appreciate that well, that the plant arrive here before the second fertilization. There are a part of the field, the green one, that is the, the, the well-developed one that is above the one 
the, the value of one of nitrogen nutrition index. So it means it needs less or it is in optimal condition. But other part of the field was below this and it required more fertilization. So if we, ad we, we adapt, we use this indicator to provide fertilization, we can see that after the second fertilization, the field is in the same condition. So the meaning of this is that we have a diagnostic instrument and if we are able to map NNA in some way, we are able to uh, manage also the fertilization in the right way, uh, giving uh, the right amount in the right place. Okay? So here are the two comments. Here we have the deficiency before and then the, the post-fertilization increase that, that make the field in the same condition. Okay? So we were speaking about before, again, on dilution, the dilution curve. That means biomass from one side and the nitrogen on the other. But at the end, we, what we are interested in is the amount of nitrogen in the field because it's what we have to do with the fertilization. So a simple way to pass from this concept to this one is that if we multiply the nitrogen concentration by biomass, we can have another curve that exactly tell you how much nitrogen you have in the plant is nitrogen uptake. That is exactly the agronomical information versus the biomass. And again, we can see the delta of the difference if we are in, in, in nutritional deficiency or not. Okay. So we can have excess or deficiency. But all those story is how to estimate nitrogen and biomass. So this is the, the topic of, of the discussion. So Guerif and Barre have uh, proposed this scheme to say how to do that. We have different choice according to what we consider best and our skill in, in handling the data and our relative data we can have uh, to, to use it. So the first method is to use vegetation index or chlorophyll estimates to directly relate to nitrogen concentration. Do you remember the beginning? We showed that there was a clear relation between chlorophyll concentration and, and uh, nitrogen, okay? Then we can define the nitrogen, relative nitrogen, and arrive to the quantity of nitrogen in the plant. And if we compare with the critical one, we have our, our target, that is the delta. The second way is to directly estimate nit 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 nitrogen, nitrogen index, again, and thanks to the critical curve that tell us how much should be the nitrogen, we can have the real nitrogen, and again, the uh, quantity that is the delta between the theoretical one and the real one. Or else we can skip everything, and we saw before that there is a relation between the canopy chlorophyll content, okay, leaf area index, per chlorophyll, and the nitrogen content in the canopy. So those are three schema, okay? So I show you three examples for each of these the schema, and then an experimental example that make uh, the things clearer. So we, we, we are in the optical remote sensing. We start from reflectance. We can uh, analyze this reflectance in terms of vegetation index or spectral feature or in a indirect way, we can process those and create an already estimated biophysical parameter, like you see with the marine vase yesterday. So chlorophyll, guy that is green area index, or canopy chlorophyll content, okay? So this is called indirect, then I tell you why, according to Deloy, she was a PhD student here in UCL, and the material I'm showing is come from, from those universities. So the direct one, it's used to use the vegetation index and estimate the nitrogen percentage directly or NNE. So the three approach we can have is, I want to estimate the nitrogen, then the biomass. So I have the two input of the famous graph, biomass and nitrogen, so I can see if my conditions are close or not to the critical one. Or I can have directly the nitrogen nutritional index. So I have directly an indicator that tell me if I'm above or below one, so it means if I'm in a critical or not condition. Or I can estimate the canopy nitrogen content. So, question for the first one, is there something in envy and I think an RGN from normalized different nitrogen index like the first one or? 
normalized different heterogeneous index is an index derived by reflectance. Okay, so it's something that here in the spectral transformation you can transform, exploiting the, the information in the visible and the red edge and having an index uh, that you demonstrate a, a experimental that is more related to nitrogen concentration. But the output that we want it here are the crop parameter. So how to arrive to the crop parameter, okay? So we have these three methods. Okay, one is the direct one, two direct. First, I estimate the nitrogen and the biomass. The second, directly, the nitrogen index. The third is called indirect. First, I estimate the biophysical uh, variable that I know that are related to nitrogen uptake. Then I, then I have those indirect relation between nitrogen uptake and biophysical variable. So the first topic for all those systems is the biomass estimation. Biomass estimation, you can see here from different literature uh, research, is can be related to Lifare index or green Lifare index. Well related, but they can have problem you see different to, due to the here, so it's not constant. Later we will see other two approaches from crop modeling, from semi-empirical modeling, how to estimate biomass, okay? But first, we have to estimate biomass. This is the same for all the method. The second, we need the critical nitrogen, uh, uh, critical dilution curves. Uh, fortunately, we have a lot of research about that. So the form is for all the different crop in the same way. Nitrogen concentration is equal to a parameter multiplied by the weight, I mean the biomass of the plant, at exponent of, with an exponent. And here we have, the, um, we are lucky, we have a lot of A and B parameter for the different uh, plant, crop that you are interested in. So you don't have to do that again. You can, have, you can use the one that you have in, uh, in literature already published. You can have this nice curve. So if you have this curve, you can compare your estimates to that uh, clearly understand if the crop is in a good or bad condition. I just give you those, don't just to have it here in your uh, material, don't, don't uh, spend too much time, just to tell you that this is the, the characteristic one, above, by my, by above ground biomass and nitrogen, okay? But there are other approaches that have developed directly with LIFAR index or with the um, the growing degree days. It means that you can relate not with the biomass, but just with the season that is going on with the development of the crop or with the Lifare index. The things that is wh why we are very interested about that, because from a remote sensing point of view, those is a parameter we can estimate directly. So we don't have to go indirectly to the above, bi bi above ground biomass. So we are happy to having also Dilution curves that already have LIFAR index and plant nitrogen concentration. Okay, so let's go to the first part. So we want to estimate nitrogen uh, uh, concentration from vegetation index. Okay, the first approach. There are several uh, approaches in literature. You can see that you can have nice relation between vegetation index and biomass, as I told you before. Okay, and other vegetation index and nitrogen concentration. This was made on uh, uh, exploiting hyperspectral data, but it can be modulated to multispectral data, and on corn, on maize. This other was done on rice, and again, you have nice correlation between plant nitrogen concentration, and in this case, not using the weight, the biomass, but the LIFAR index. So when you develop those on your uh, particular case for your crop, so this is the effort that you have to do with your experimental data. Once you did it, you have your nice equation, and then you can exploit the equation in this way. I can make a map of LIFAR index. So this is how LIFAR index is variable in the field, okay? And this is a map, sorry, on the contrary, uh, plant nitrogen concentration, sorry and how LIFAR index is variable in, in, in the field. So for each point of our image, from here and here, we can have an idea in this um, domain where each pixel, each part of the field is. So we can have an area with high lie and low plant nitrogen concentration. 
k, like this condition. We have a leaf R index of 2, but we are with very low plant nitrogen, so we are far from the critical curve. So it means that uh, our situation is bad. Or on the contrary, we can have a situation that is a bit better than uh, the critical condition. So exploiting those, those two uh, equations, we have those two maps. And thanks to the elution curve, we can have an NNA maps. So this is, at the end, what is of help for the farmer to modulate the fertilization. This is an example of one field, and this of another. And we can comment, of course, this was our experiment. We saw that this part of the field, this farmer used green manure. So it used a preceding crop that is a nitrogen fixation crop, legumes. Okay. So he, he tried to enrich the field. And in fact, when we analyzed that, it was better than this other field in general because of this green fertilization. Okay. And on the other one, we also analyzed those patterns. And we say that there were a great soil variability here. And this corner, it was much less fertile, fertile, fertile than, than the rest of the field. So the method, it works. It's uh, pretty easy. The work you should do, I mean, experimentally in create your relation. When you have your relation, we can automatically produce your nitrogen nutritional index maps. OK? We also validate that in order to decide which value are supposed to provide information on, oh, below a certain amount of nitrogen nutrition you have to fertilize. Above, you can skip it, save money, and save environmental problem. Up to now, it's OK, more or less. OK. So the second approach, it's a bit more straightforward. We don't estimate what is really, uh, from a uh, biophysical point of view, the, the main concept, it means nitrogen and biomass, or nitrogen and lifari index, we go straight on to nutritional, uh, nitrogen nutritional index. This it could be, if it works, even better, because we can have a straight way to provide those maps to the farmer. So we did another experiment. So we, 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 we didn't create variability. We went in the real farming condition. So we, we capture what was the real condition there, acquiring information in different parts that results with different uh, crop development. So you see before this graph in which we, we monitor uh, NIFARA index for different fields. And all those, if you see, because they were just managed in a regular way, before the second fertilization, they all have the drops. Okay. So this confirmed that the farmers do the, the work in the right way. I mean, exactly before the second fertilization, you have a drop of nitrogen, nitrogen index. So this is from the field. But we don't want to do that from the field. We want that from satellite. So we extract for the same area all the Sentinel-2 spectral information in time, OK, for each field that we monitor. And then we investigate the relation between uh, <coughs> NDRA, that is the normalized different red edge index, okay? So it's exploiting the red edge bands of uh, Sentinel-2 and the NNAE quantity in the field. So we were happy because we had more than 100 uh, points that. And what we discover, those two, this one and this one, are the two uh, period, phenological period we are interested in because they are before the first fertilization and before the second. In general, before the first fertilization, what is driven really is the soil condition. So you don't have really the capacity to provide uh, information useful from remote sensing. But in the second one, in the panicle initiation, we have a nice cover. So the, the, the plant is already covered everything. So you are in the right condition. We don't have problem of fractional cover, sea soil, and plants. And we found that there is a nice correlation, and that we can use this in a predictive way. So while before we saw that we estimate first the nitrogen concentration, then the biomass or the FR index, here we demonstrated that it is possible to go straight on with the in direct in uh, relation with uh, nitrogen nutritional index. So what we see this afternoon is already to have nitrogen nitrogen index maps, and we analyze that. Okay. So the third and last uh, approach 
is the more complicated one, but in theory is the more predictive, a powerful one. Because what we do is we try to go directly from uh, the quantity of chlorophyll that we can estimate from remote sensing. You see yesterday with Marin Weiss approach. So you can estimate with the radiate transfer model uh, LIFAR index, chlorophyll or canopy chlorophyll content, okay? So is that? So the, the question is, if we estimate canopy uh, chlorophyll content, are we able to directly link to the quantity of uh, nitrogen in the plant, the uptake of nitrogen in the plant? So the colleague here of UCL, they, they did this, uh, oh, they did this um, experiment here in Belgium. The crop was the wheat. They also wanted to test conventional and organic field. So the, the topic in the field, they, they measure leaf index and chlorophyll. And they tested the retrieval method that is exactly what uh, Marin Weiss is doing and exploiting his model, the biophysical variable retrieval. OK. OK. Up to now, we spoke more about the agronomy part. But there is also a remote sensing part that I have to address. I mean, a problematic in the remote sensing uh, part of retrieval of radio transfer model that I don't know if uh, Marie uh, mentioned yesterday. When we use radio transfer model, you try to uh, invert a model that giving a LAI value and chlorophyll concentration value give you the idea how the spectrum should be. Is it right? Is what you understand from the lesson yesterday? OK. So the topic is to go in backward, inverting that. So how we have the spectra we want to estimate the variable. But for the what is called the ILPOS problem, one of the problem is that different combination of LIFAR index and chlorophyll content generate the same uh, spectral uh, characteristics. So this means that we, when we invert that, we don't know in which combination we are. One of the reasons that minimize this problem is if we pass to canopy level. So instead of estimate the chlorophyll at the leaf level, we can estimate the chlorophyll at canopy level. So what is called CCC. So before we saw that CCC is much more related to the quantity of nitrogen in the plants, less affected by the cultivar variety, less affected by phenological status. But this is something that we observe in the field. Then we have another aspect that is related to the retrieval with the uh, radio transfer model that we see that uh, it's much more better to work in with this canopy level variable instead of single. So this is the other aspect. So the colleagues here in, in Louvain, they use the, the model of Marine Weiss. They estimate chlorophyll content, okay, in, from, from, from the field and, and from the images. And you see that the, the performance are OK, but not the best. When you pass to canopy chlorophyll content, the relation is much more better. So this is the indicator they use it. OK? And they related this indicator directly to the content of nitrogen in the plants. So the nice thing is that they demonstrate that uh, before I was, expressing, I was explaining you something that all of us can do with our experiment. Here is something that uh, we can do in silico with the exploiting um, radiant transfer modeling, OK? And we demonstrated that the, the, the solution that was adopted is really correlated with the concentration of the nitrogen in the canopy. So this is good. The other good thing is the Sentinel-2 red edge band are fundamental to improve the retrieval. They, 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 they tested different combination of bands. And we see we pass from 0 0.77 in terms of R square for the second fertilization to 0 0.9. So it's really good. OK. The problem is that, again, that this relation is phenological dependent. So again, we solve part of the problem using radiant transfer. So we can do that in silico, I mean, quickly. But again, when we want to estimate the nitrogen uptake, we still have to calibrate that with experimental data. And we see that we have to calibrate with two different uh, correlation for the two different stages. OK, so this is not a bad news, but it's something critical. 
And the bad news is that because the, 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 the colleagues try also to understand in organic field, they found that it's uh, uh, pretty difficult. So you see the estimation in, in organic field is due to really low correlation. And the reason not is because it's organic, because the plant is the same, the nitrogen in the plant is the same, but because of the extremely heterogeneity of the field. When you have a well-managed field, okay, with the mineral fertilization, usually is, is well, is uh, uh, homogeneous, and this is from a remote sensing point of view is extremely important. While when you have a, an organic field, it can be heterogeneous, so from a remote sensing point of view, you can have a spectra that is a mixture and you cannot solve very well the situation. Okay, so now all those theoretical part that maybe was too much for you, it is uh, done. The question is, uh, that was addressed by our colleague here in Louvain is, okay, we see that it's possible. So the conclusion it cannot be chlorophyll content, okay, that you should have learned how to retrieve yesterday with Marine Weiss, can be used to assess the canopy nitrogen concentration. How much nitrogen we have in the plant? Good. So if we know how much uh, nitrogen we have in the plant at that specific moment or at that specific biomass, we can know, comparing with the critical one, if we have uh, nitrogen deficiency or no. So this is the, 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 the main message. But the question are, the relation we saw are stable over time, okay, or do impact. The other, we saw that the biophysical variable estimates are good, but if we don't, we have to use vegetation index, which is the best. And at the end, because this is the, the main message, when we map the nitrogen nutritional index, can we give support to decision? I mean, to tell the farmer, the farmer doesn't want to have all those uh, science behind. They say, okay, do I have to fertilize how much and when? So I just give you a, a, a bit more graphs, but not too much in detail. So the colleagues, uh, they, they, they try to analyze a wider data set from 2016 to 2018. So those were, again, the biophysical variable retrieve, green array index, chlorophyll and canopy chlorophyll content. And they compare with other two indexing literature that are supposed to be the best for uh, biomass that exploit the red edge position. And another one that is the chira that is exploiting two bands in the Sentinel-2 <coughs> for chlorophyll and nitrogen. Okay, so this awful table you don't have to see. You have in your, <coughs> in your um, material later. I just go to, this, to the point. So what they wanted to see, they, they take all the data from 2016 to 2018 and say, okay, let's see if, we, if it is robust relation within the season. So take the data from the same here, okay? Keep it out, the data from that field, using all the other field to predict the field and see how, how good is the, the prediction. Or else use all the data from all the other years and again, leave it out one field and predict it. Because they wanted to know how far we can go in prediction without having a seasonal calibration. So the first message is that uh, biophysical variables are better than uh, vegetation index. Those are errors. So the lower the number, the best is. So when we consider all the data from all the season, okay, we see that biophysical variables are better. But you can see also if we did the data from one single season. And the first message is, okay, biophysical retrieval from uh, uh, the marine base uh, model, it's fine. Let's use it so we can be predictive. The second that is a, a, a bit more uh, problematic is that the error are more higher when we use an independent data set, when we put together all the years. So it means that the variability that we have, we are not still able to capture. So we need, it's better, to, we need to stay on having seasonal relation. And that could be a problematic because it needs a, a seasonal adjustment, means people in the field having information, okay? But they are not that bad. But the good news is that uh, those information that I give you is for the canopy nitrogen content, the nitrogen in the canopy, the dry matter, so all those comments I was doing before, but when we pass to the nitrogen nutrition indexes, that's what we wanted to do. 
we see that there was no much difference between calibration between one season and calibration between several seasons. So this is the really good news because it means that we can use by a physical variable. In case we don't have, we can use vegetation index. And this should be predictive across here and across phenological stages. So in conclusion, what they did, because this is what we, we want to do, we want to predict NNA. And here we tested with the one in the field and tell the farmers, OK, when you should apply or not. So they did a statistical analysis. And they see that above, above 1, 1 1.06, you have the 75% probability that you are in a good condition in the field that you don't need to fertilize much. While when you have lower than 0 0.7, 0 0.8 and NE, you are in a condition that is the cold fertilization zone. So the big story about all this, I try to recap, and then we see uh, um, real cases, okay, is that nitrogen, nitrogen index is a key indicator for managing uh, nit nitrogen. Then uh, I leave the stage to your question. Then the biophysical variable uh, are robust to estimate dry matter and canopy nitrogen content, but also vegetation index are good. And why that? If you don't have already uh, set up your model for a specific sensor, it means that you can use other sensor with the uh, vegetation index. So you can have much more possibility for the farmer to give the, the data to them. The NNA can be estimated using this global data set. So it become more stable across here. So the relation between NNA is, is stable. And uh, in conclusion from, from the colleague here of uh, UCLL that the, the, the NNA they develop, it's uh, fundamental to decide to support the third fertilization to the farmer. So it's really a decision support tool. Any question? Then I show you. OK, fine. I, I just <coughs> Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, they told me that I should give you the the microphone because they have to record question and answer. Thanks. Uh, I just I just wonder. Oops. I just wonder which type of um, fertilization did you use in the experiment of of the trick? Did you recommend the farmers to use like manure, um, urea? No, it was, it was mineral. But I mean. The one from uh, UCL, we could, we could ask to the guys, but it was, I'm sure what, it was, was a it mineral, mineral? Uh, fertilizer. OK. Because okay. I wonder whether that would affect the nitrogen uptake for the plant, yeah, and how much effect, would it affect. It affect. Yeah. In, in the theory, I mean, the whole story is that we, in this room, we should be remote sensing guys. OK, so we should arrive to say, oh, are we able to provide a diagnostic, uh, physiological-related information that can give a picture of the crop nutritional status, yes. It's not all the whole picture, okay? The other picture is exactly as you did the, the question. It means uh, which kind of fertilizer, how much does it take to be absorbed by the, the plant. If it is manual, it have to be mineralized, okay? So a lot of, of those issues. So we stop a bit in the, in, in, in the other part. Okay, keep the microphone, maybe it's, it's good. So I just wanted to show that uh, Please go and, uh, and see this uh, site. I don't know if it was already mentioned by the professor in these days. This is a Belgium initiative, really, really interesting, because it's a Belgian collab collaborative agricultural monitoring system. So it's a free platform between farmer, authorities, and the university. And they uh, provide to the farmers uh, information from remote sensing. So what we saw, they provide the nitrogen absorbed by the crops, canopy, nitrogen content, C and C. Then NAE, okay. The development, because you want to know when you are in terms of development, that is green array index profile. Then from those, the biomass of, in, in this case, because they, were, they work on winter wheat at the, the specific moment. And the, uh, we were discussing before, also the biomass of the green manure, because it, I, I tell you, is an information that you should take into account for your fertilization plan to know if you have any residual uh, nitrogen in the soil. And this is not a residual, but it's something that you do to en enrich the nitrogen content in the soil. 
with the green menu. And of course, it estimates. Maybe if we have time here, you have the, this platform, it's really nice. And you see that they provide for, 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 for the fields of the format that they apply uh, an NAE map in, uh, uh, in time for every time that uh, sat a good satellite uh, uh, observation is uh, available, okay? This is another example. So now I go fast to what we did, we, me and, uh, and the, my colleagues, some of them are here, so we can have a chat uh, further on. So I go quickly, just to show you that the reason of this project was to demonstrate European Union pay for this demonstration activity. Say, okay, let me see that what the research has done can be applied. And uh, this was done by creating an automatic procedure to generate AO information from Sentinel. So we went, gave Sentinel maps. We distributed that with web service and we create an NA map by a conjunction with the farmer with the smart scouting application and I, I show you. And, but we wanted to do a step forward to apply directly in, in, in the season those maps in, uh, in the fertilization activity. Okay, here are the, the characteristics of the experiment you will have in, uh, in, uh, in your material. The framework, important framework is, okay, we saw that uh, the fertilization is not something that uh, is, is linked to the crop development. So the first important thing is to have information when you should do that then where, that is the zone where you have to apply the fertilizer, then how much it means, which is the status of the plant, okay? What is the choice of fertilization? In that case, it was mineral, according to the nutritional nitrogen index, then creating the maps and then apply that. So the difference be between before was that. So to, 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 again, we are remote sensing guys. What we can do is to observe what is now, I mean yesterday, or what's happened in, in the past, during the season or in the previous season. We cannot predict anything, okay? But one of the problems when, when you work with the, the support to farmer is that they have to, to know information in advance. They have to organize themselves. Maybe some of the activity they do, they don't do directly, but they have uh, other um, company they do for them. So usually you have to do a forecast. The only way to do forecast is using model. So there are some models, phenological models that we adopt that decide the, the, the category of variety in terms of phenological cycle and the date, this is in Italian, sorry, but I, I think you can, you can understand, and the date of, which, of when you sow. So according to this information, the sowing date and the type of variety and the meteorological information from a meteor station, they can have every day the farmer and information how far they are from the right moment to fertilize. And we use meteor forecast to have six days in advance. So they have almost one week to understand, okay, in the next week I'm in the right time to do the fertilization. First message from the crop, from crop modeling. Second message is to having automatic procedure to generate remote sensing data. This is an open source solution that you can find in base um, developing R from a colleague. Thanks to this uh, solution, we can download and process all the remote sensing data automatically. Okay, so skipping uh, time and mistake and saving time for the analyst. Then when, the, when the, uh, remote sensing data arrive, what we have to do? The main message is that we wanted to give different fertilization in the field, okay? So we have, analyzed, we have to analyze field by field. We adopt an indicator that is uh, called air bias that give us an idea of the variability, uh, intra-field variability. This intra-field variability then, our bias was used with a clustering procedure that analyze the histograms. We, see, we will see also the histogram of, of the images uh, of the field today in the lesson, okay? So we see that this field is homogeneous, no need uh, variable fertilization. This has two main class, okay? It is as three classes. So those become the basis for the machinery to produce the variable fertilization maps. Then going with these maps quickly in the field, exploiting smart application means mobile phone, okay? We can assess for those area, which is the nitrogen nutritional condition. So the LAI of those area, the 
nitrogen concentration of the area, okay? And at the end, having the nitrogen, the NNAE for each of these areas. Why that was important? Then using, a, again, a wet platform to send in those information from the regional area, all those area, to the farm, to the single field, okay? So at the end, with those information, we went with the farmer, we defined those, we create the maps, okay? And then we put the maps on the tractor. So the conclusion is that from, from the silico, from the computer, from the field activity, we had this map for modeling the fertilizer in the field, okay? And just to give you an idea, we decide those parts to manage in a variable rate technology and this part in a constant way. And then we went also with the harvester, now they are this harvester able to make yield maps. So at the end, we also harvest the field. So the lesson was that we have the monitoring of satellite. In the right moment, we create the maps. This map is provided to the farmer for having a quick scout in some few points. Thanks to the relation that we saw before with nitrogen index, we calculate a map of the nitrogen status, define the fertilization maps, put in the tractor, and then we, after some months, we observe the results. So these, the yield map results. This is the nitrogen apply. You can see we save a lot of nitrogen here in the variable uh, part manage. The majority of, the, of this, this, this field, it was saved, was reduced the amount of nitrogen we provided. In other, we gave more. So we have an environmental idea of what was the efficiency in terms of the relation between the nitrogen we apply and the production we had. And at the end, if we compare the two parts, we had more production in managing the, 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 the hill. We have more or less the same amount of nitrogen, but this is was modulated. You see the histogram blue while on the other part it was constant. And at the end, efficiency, it was much more for the uh, variable rate part. Sorry. Um, Try to, no? Um, the maps on the right, are they from the machine? Those one? Yeah. Yes. Those are from the yield, the yield, the harvester uh, harvest, and then they have a sensor inside that produce you meter by meter. It depends on, on the frequency. It's a mess. This part, it seems easy, but it's a mess. We have a couple of colleagues here that works on, on this data. You can spoke with them. This should be the standard in Europe, but it's not yet. Also because the, the company that uh, earned this, uh, that manage this stuff, don't see yet an advantage. Farmer, the market is not asking for having really calibrating data. This is the, the bottleneck of those situations. And we are speaking in Europe where it should be, I mean, a developed <coughs> country, union, okay, where you should exploit as much as possible those information, but it's not. So we have also, as a European citizen, <coughs> having some incentive mechanism to, to make those information uh, available and useful for the environmental part that we can see. Okay, please. Uh, I was wondering if you try to understand why the, the low productivity, like in the lower corner, that is, uh, as I can see, almost half of the productivity of the best. And you the second, here? yes, the, this the brown, corner? yes, this okay. brownish. If you have a motivation for this low productivity, and the second question is, at the beginning you mentioned the proximal sensing. Yep. That is much more straightforward. Yes. Could you tell us uh, what are the what could be if could be more easily implemented, and what are the pros and cons of uh, implementing uh, proximal sensing? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Reason for uh, uh, differentiation in the yield. This one is uh, related to the question of before. You see, there are some artificial uh, pattern. Okay, so the machinery doesn't work always in the right way. So it's better to see on the global in terms of the global statistic for the area. The other thing is that the majority of what we see in our experience is the soil condition. The soil is determinant. 
in fact, we're doing that. There's a soil expert here that can confirm it or not. Uh, is the soil that determines the, the, not only the availability of nitrogen for the crops, but also the, the relation, the capacity of the crop to, to update the nitrogen uh, from the soil. In the corner, it's easy that you can have problem because it's also our, the, the part that is more difficult to be managed. Or this is also a rice field, so we have uh, continuous flooding. And what we found, I didn't think about that before, that the water arrived always from a corner. And then you have a mechanical um, action also from, from the water on the plants. Some, some seeds are going away, so it's less dense, but also on, on the fertilizer you provide. So the re but, but if I would say something from a, an agronomical point of view, remote sensing point of view, I would say it's soil. All the other are managed questions. So if you do, would, uh, would not have a, a, a field like that that is really shaped, maybe you, you would not see this effect. But if you have different in the soil, you will see that. Do you want another? Ah, OK. And the proximal sensing. Oh, sorry. The proximal sensing is really, uh, it's a really good solution. Uh, there are two problems. One, again, you need in machinery to do that. So there is a, really a barrier for the farmer to adopt such uh, systems. I tell you, the harvester, you need the harvester. Otherwise, you don't have your product, you don't, have, you, you don't sell your product, and you still have problem in having good data there on the majority. While the, the proximal sensor are at least, um, till now are something for uh, a minority of uh, expert more related to uh, research or R&D. And the problem is the calibration of the sensor there. And the, the things that always, often the relation between the sensor detection and the, the rules, because the, 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 the nice things of the proximal sensor is they should be, they, they say, ongoing. So you don't need to produce the maps before. You don't do the analysis, but you do the infill. But they are based on, on a sim really simplification of the, of the approaches. So often what they do, this sensor, is almost more or less they measure NDVI or, or a proxy of that. So what we, you do, I try to explain you, uh, and please if you don't uh, uh, make me question, that NDVI is a proxy of biomass, not of the nutritional status. Of course, if you have, a low bi if you have the same field, cultivated in the same moment, with the same variety, with the same management, if you have a, a difference in biomass, it means that you have different in, uh, in, uh, in, in development nutritional condition. But not necessarily they are due to the fertilization. There could be other limitation factor. So the only problem in, in theory is that the, the simpl simplification to uh, arrive to the decision is that one. In fact, often, what is uh, proposed is to have a strip in the field with uh, no limiting uh, nitrogen condition that when you go, it's sort of uh, uh, on the fly calibration of the system. But if you think about that, it's not something that you can propose in real farming condition. Okay. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I would like to ask, because okay, you had this uh, cluster map in cross mm -hmm. status, mm -hmm. yeah? and based on that, you do the prescription map, mm -hmm. and then you uh, mesh, identify how much you have to apply. Mm -hmm. Did you take like uh, information about the, about, did you try to get this cluster map again after applying the nitrogen? So you know that the yield is because of the application of nitrogen, or maybe the yield is, okay, maybe the, the response you got was from some other condition rather than nitrogen application. This is a, a right question. We did it, we tried to do the, the cluster map again. <coughs> but when you go further in the season, the, the, the density of the plant, it, we had two problems. One the density of the plant has become uh, uh, in some way saturated the remote sensing signal, so are not any more significant what you produce. <coughs> the second that if you fall further in the season, it's become the senescence, so you don't have any more uh, the information of, of the plant status. What you, what you were asking, it was in part uh, reply by doing that in several fields, all splitting in a, in a variable one and in a, in, a, in a standard managed one. And we more or less have the same uh, effect. But I would say that uh, one of the things is that uh, the farmers, thanks to those it, and thanks to his knowledge, 
it create prescription maps that are adapted to, to, the, to, to the field. Some of the farmers say, oh, I know that corner is really sandy, so it doesn't make any sense to, to do that. And at the end, it, it have an effect on the efficiency more than on, on, on the yield. You can lose something in the yield, but I think in the world, in terms of efficiency balance, and increase. I don't know if I reply to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It was like just I wanted to know if you were sure that this yield you got, you got there was due to the right uh, distribution of nitrogen. Uh, th that's the, the, the nice things is this one. This is the really nice things. I mean, this part in the corner we gave a lot, you see, mm -hmm. but this part is a huge part. We, we really gave 20% uh, less than, than was supposed to be given. Mm -hmm. So that's the nice things. So. And if you see here from the map, from, sorry, from the hill map, okay, it's not the most, but it's much more uh, efficient, the situation. So of course, when you work, I mean, I come from the environmental uh, aspect. So when I think about this thing, so we wanted to demonstrate that remote sensing is helpful in having more sustainable production. And in my opinion, more sustainable production means less pollution, okay? So your idea is always, oh, I want to demonstrate that you reduce the, the the amount of nitrogen you, you gave. But it's not the whole picture. Uh, also to give, at the end, we see we gave the same amount globally. If you do an integral of the nitrogen you gave here and you gave here, it's the same. But you did it in a different way. Mm. Optimize one. And I'm pretty happy that this wide area was given less than 20% of the prescriptive one. Okay, thank you. I agree that this is one field. The other field have more or less the whole have the same situation, but it's not so unique, the, the response. So you really need a, a lot of uh, experiment and, and, and data about that. You said that you were working on nitrogen. Yeah, oh. right. Um, that's uh, my question. Did you also use one of the N sensors uh, that are available, like uh, Yara or Isaria no. or something? Because they are specifically measuring, usually, in the red edge yes. area. Yes, this so goes it's on. Not, not only biomass, then. Um, if you take a smartphone, you won't, won't have that, basically. You only have a biomass or a coverage value there. OK, the, the Yara sensor you were mentioning, you mean the, the mobile or the one in the tractor? Uh, any. Uh, so you had the, um, what is it, tester, end tester, mm -hmm. I think, uh, which is fine. For yeah. OK, two, two questions. Everything that is at the contact is fine. But is at contact. So our idea is to have a workflow that can be repeated, it can be spread. So if you have an app on, on a smartphone, you can give to the farmer. You cannot think to give to the farmer a sensor like that. So the second thing is that the one on the tractor have the same problem. There are Yara sensor on the tractor have the same problem I was mentioning before. Yes, they use um, uh, red edge bands, but the majority of the information comes from, from the reflectance of the, of, of the canopy. So it, it's again, is the same problem. They work a lot, they very well, but when they arrive with the pre-calibrate uh, curves, and what I found, because those, those um, companies have worked in the in US or in north of Europe, then when you apply those calibration curves in, in, in other contexts, it does not very well. That's the... Okay, that might be. <laughs> but um, Another question, what did you decide on uh, how to... Uh, in, did you increase uh, in the bad areas or did you reduce in the bad areas? Because the calibration direction, let's say, differs also yeah, between this the is, this is a, a good question because everybody consider that, uh, that uh, uh, if you think about NDVA, okay, m more of those uh, systems have, have a relation with NDVA. Say low NDVI, you give more and less, in, um, sorry, low NDVI, you give more and less NDVI, you, no, a high NDVI, you give less. The problem is exactly what uh, uh, what we were discussing about the. Sorry, I go here. Then maybe it's faster. Then I'll try to to give you this last concept. Then we we have other questions. Then we move on. Uh, here. So um, one comment and sorry, one question. Sorry, I have okay. to reply to him. No. So, okay. No. The point is this one. If uh, if you have a so your name? Martin. Martin. So one of the problems is, of course, if you have low NDVI, it means you have low, a bad crop condition, OK? But a bad crop condition, it means also that you can have limiting factors that are not related to, to, to. 
So the best solution is that more or less the plant is developed in the same way, and some has a deficiency, okay, in terms of nitrogen content, and not a really bad situation, because this means that there's something else. So what's happening if you have very low NDVI with compared to I, that you could be in a, in a condition that in terms of this curve, think about that the average of the field is six, okay, and the other is uh, four, I don't know. So the delta, the amount that you have to give to reach this concentration, it should be less than, than the one here. It means those, those, those uh, um, idea, idea of the dilution curves is that you should relate to the condition that he has, not with the condition of someone else. So for this reason, some curves are on the opposite because they say, oh, you have less biomass. Of course, you need more relative to the same biomass, but less with respect to, to the higher one because the total amount of nitrogen you provide is related to the total amount of needs of the plant that is the biomass of the plants. The, the bigger it is, the more it needs, okay? So this is the reason why you say curves are like this or other like that. In my opinion, if, if, if this uh, average, the field, no big difference, the, the direct one, it makes sense because the difference you see is relating to, to a deficiency. If there are really this homogeneous area, that could be other reason. And in that case, you, you get uh, loss uh, nitrogen to the environment because maybe it's not the limiting factor that. So the plant has some other problems that cannot allow to take off the nitrogen. Okay? Then we have to go. Okay, just one comment. I, I think exactly that this is really an exercise for optimizing nitrogen use. So reducing the environmental impact, but there was no limiting factor analysis uh, paramount to this telling you, okay, this is a, an issue of nitrogen or it's water or it's the soil texture. Uh, but the question was, you mentioned that the, the um, farmers interact with the mobile. Mm -hmm. Is that your input data? Is that your field data coming from the mobile or did you have to do sampling? I no, coming from the part. No, the idea is to develop something that comes from uh, directly from the farmer in a VGI, in voluntary geographic information framework. So the idea is that, uh, as it was demonstrated here by UCL, you have something that is straightforward, and then here by here, involving much more farmer, you're going to calibrate that more. So you can do in two ways: one, it in in uh, uh, refine the solution for the next year, and the other one is to tuning to the specific field by, by the farmer activity. But to do that, there would be a really, uh, let's, let's say, a government or, or a collaborative uh, approach, not just uh, one scientific experiment. What we demonstrated, the workflow, it works, and that the acquisition with the smart application that are not sensors, I mean, expensive one, it's working. The idea, the nice idea is that you see that before that I show you the, the green chart, the one from IRI, with the color, oh, all the farmer, more or less all the farmer knows in, with their feeling. I mean, oh, this is not a, a nice color of, 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 the, of the crop. I should do that. But what they, don't, what they cannot do, they, they cannot do for entire farm in a spatially distributed way. Okay, so this is the main uh, contribution from remote sensing that is also quantitative. So those smart applications in some way are green meters, okay? that can be calibrated for the specific situation. Seems very interesting for the portability of the approach. I mean, you can use this in any area in the world, basically, because you have Sentinel coverage, yeah. and you have the mobile, and you have the web maps. Yeah, but all the comments also from the, the lady there and, the, and from Martin are important. I mean, it's, it's not so straightforward yet. In fact, and then we go to the next uh, topic, uh, we gave a lot of... Uh, importance to all those uh, engineering and uh, uh, in silico information, but yet the decision is still a part of an, uh, an expert. So all we do, we should work more on expert system in which remote sense information it can go. Or otherwise the expert system can be also human. I'm not at all uh, worried about that. If you provide them information that make their, their decision quicker, or can they, ex um, uh, export the decision in a spatially distributed way, you did a great job. If you reduce the time in the field, if you reduce in providing spatial information, it's done. Other question? Yes? 
So I hope that it was interesting for you. A bit boring or? <coughs> Hello, hello. Just a quick question. Is it possible to also apply your methods? Uh, because in my country, some of the farmers don't have any access to fertilizer since, and they're just using legumes. Is it possible to monitor that? You are from? The Philippines. Philippines. The IRI and Phil Rice are doing great work on, uh, on, on that. On, uh, I'm providing uh, support to, to to farmers' uh, fertilization. But is it possible to monitor the nitrogen and the crop yield uh, by just, uh, uh, if, if they're not using fertilizers, they're using the natural methods such as uh, legumes or uh, okay. mung beans? <clears throat> the message I wanted to, to give you is that if we are able to assess the status of the crop, if the nitrogen that is in the plant comes from the soil availability, the mineral fertilization, the manure, or the green manure is not a problem. It's the nitrogen that the plant has uptake. What we do with the remote sensing, are we able to map and assess how much nitrogen we have in the plants? Okay, this is what we can do. All the other question, if it comes from legume or if it comes from manure, is something that we cannot say. I mean, now there's this idea that is nice to monitor also the previous season and see if you have a cover crop. So you can say, okay, the part of nitrogen comes from the nitrogen fixation of the crop. So the message, the, the reply of, to your <coughs> question is uh, that we can assess the nitrogen content. We cannot say where it comes from. The second, the big problem that you have in your country, a big, big problem, is the cloud cover. I was working in the Philippines on rice, and for this reason, the, the, the rice monitoring is made with the radar mainly. And then you, the yield forecast is something that is operational now. Thanks to Phil Rice, there is a project is called Pris, uh, Prism. Prism. You know Prism? I just heard of it. Exactly. And it works, the, the yield prediction. Because you exploit uh, SAR data, for something else, but SAR data cannot give information on nutrition status. All the optical data can do that. So the bottleneck is that one. One possible solution is to using the UAV there. But it, of course, if you do that, you can imagine that it's not that you do that uh, whatever, and it cannot be for the poor farmer, it's more for uh, union of farmer or for a big uh, company, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm happy that we are almost in time. Not, th those should be more straightforward. Okay, this, the, the other part of the, of the presentation, it should be more related to what you have seen because we're part of image and time series of the image. I'm just, I will skip some part if not uh, for, uh, your, of your interest. Okay, so the second part is related to phenometrics and the hill estimation, okay? So, the phenometrics, uh, the important things is that uh, now we, s we, again, before we see how much nitrogen is in the plants, but the important things is the plant development. I told you that you should know the, the nutritional status in a specific moment, not whatever, because that is related to the, 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 the farmer action. But in general, you can, you can uh, uh, assess what is, uh, uh, how is developing the, the, the plants using some uh, code that is the phenological code. And when we spoke about uh, agriculture, we call about agrophenology. And BBCH, maybe, have you heard about BBCH? Who, no? Okay. This is a conventional way to specifically characterize uh, the physiological, the development of, of the plants. So universal in which that when you mention that code is whatever in the world means the specific condition. Okay, this is what, to do that, you have to go in the field, take the plants, and recognize some morphological aspect. What is, uh, since the uh, 90s, it's possible to see that the temporal information from remote sense acquisition is diagnostic to provide us information about the development and physiological stages. So what we know that uh, we wanted to use those uh, temporal information for 
detect the distribution of a given crop. A lot of you work on uh, crop mapping, and this is the main contribution is the telma, tem sorry, the temporal information. But also, it is a way to reconstruct the agro practice when I saw, okay? It's not just which crop it is. And of course, the development. They, all those factors interact. So the variability we see in, 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 in the agro landscape in each single field is due by those three elements. The genotype means which variety we are. We speak about rice, but rice is not rice. There's a lot of variety, okay? Like the same is for wheat, the same is for corn, okay? The environment. In a different environmental condition, you can have speeder or lower season, okay? So the development of the plant is different. And the management. In one field you saw in one date, in another 50 days uh, later on. So all those things uh, from a landscape point of view or regional point of view make the, the matrix of, of our agroecosystem is changing a lot. And so remote sensing the objectives, are we able to give or to provide information for those matrix, I mean, for this tessellation of in a wide area, okay? So to do that, we have to process uh, the image. We can, pro sorry, we can process the image, download, pre-processing, calculate vegetation index or biophysical variable, okay? Smooth those signal, inter and interpret and in sorry, interpolate and interpret. The interpretation of those signal can provide us very important information for the phenology and for the yield forecast, because we will see later on. Those area is a proxy of the yield. So this is a vegetation index or could be a leaf array index uh, curve. We will see this afternoon in the, <coughs> in the practical. But we can, the, the objective is to detect those points, okay, those phenometrics that have a reason. To do that, uh, what you need is frequent satellite. Frequent means that you at least should need one a week. To have one a week because of the clouds, you should have one a day. So from one uh, image per day, you make, can make composite. And up to the Sentinel-2 era, what we could do that is just with core resolution satellite. So with the vegetation, so with MODIS, with Proba-V that uh, Pierre yesterday rem reminded you that was a way to the continuation of spot, or with the Sentinel-3. So the main, the main problem or the main advantage is that we have really frequent data. The main problem is that there are coarse resolution, okay, between 250 meters to one kilometer. So this is a problem in terms of landscape fragmentation. So when we have homogeneous situation, doesn't mean a single field. It could be also a patches of field, but they are on the same variety, cultivated in the same way. This is a clear signal. When you have a heterogeneous field, is not. So in this condition, what you can do, if you have to provide information at farm scale, at farm level, doesn't mean necessary to the farmer, but it means that the information you provide it at field level. For the past, the only way to do, okay, those are the data we have available. For now, thanks to Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B and OLI, we have pretty much information at high resolution, decametric resolution. So instead of using moderate resolution, now we can do that with high resolution. For the past, the only way is to integrate, there are nice paper and, and, and nice application of the fusion between low resolution data, but the, the daily revisiting cycle with high resolution data that are available when they are. Those can help you in uh, reconstruct what was in the past. But if we see the seasonal monitoring now, we can exploit the decametric uh, information. Here I mentioned only the optical one, but for the phenological um, assessment also, the Sentinel-1, the SAR data can be exploited. Okay, this is an example of the HERA where we are now. So those are the Sentinel data 2 and Sentinel-2 A and B for one orbit, 108, 108. Because this is an overlapping area between two orbits, we can even have much more frequent. So we can interpolate the signal, recognize the crop. This is a field with a double crop. This is a field with pasture, so it's cover all the here. This is a field with the row crops. This is a field with maize, okay. This is a field of wheat, so winter crop, then bare soil. And then derive phenometrics, OK? 
Okay. How to do that? Sorry if I run a bit, but then, then we have more time later. We have first, did you see the uh, smoothing process interpolation of data in, in, in the other lesson? Yes. So I just leave you this stuff for, for the material. I don't, I don't waste much time. But one of the point is necessary because the data are spurious and are um, with noise. You need to interpolate that. When you interpolate that, you can extract information from um, phenological information, from phenometrics. And one information, I'm just mentioning that because we will see this afternoon, is the start of the season. It's a, it's a proxy of when it was sown the crop. Okay, that can be done in different way. Can be done in analyzing those signal in terms of value and looking for an absolute threshold, say above a certain AVI value, I know that the plant is already in the field. So I can detect the time when this condition occur. Or can I have a relative situation in which I don't using a fixed threshold, but I analyze the cycle, the maximum and the minimum, and find a percentage value for which I can detect the start. I'm mentioning that because we will do the exercise today, so I, I can skip it. The other way is to do signal analysis. Instead of doing that with the crisp threshold or adapted threshold, doing a derivative analysis. In this case, i looking for this inflection point. I do an a derivative analysis of this curve. So the first maximum of this curve is the inflection point. It could be when we consider that the season is starting that field, which is the objective. We have for each pixel, or let's say for each field, for each field, this signal. What we want to know is when it was sown, OK? It was sown at that date. So we want you to detect this data. And this will be done today, to, uh, today, uh, this afternoon. So I just show you what we did in the past for original application. OK, this is, was RISE. So this is uh, the, the RISE signal. The signal you see here is the uh, a water signal because it's related to the flooding. OK, so we were able to have a system that could detect automatically the uh, crop establishment when it was so, the emergence of the rice, the heading means the maximum of the flowering, close to the flower and the maturity. Here is in a temperature, in temperate condition, Spain and Turkey. Here it was in tropical condition in Bangladesh. So the, the mess become when you have multiple season, are we able to detect one season, not the other? Okay, so we were able to detect the, the, the rice season with respect to the winter wheat season. Okay. And of course, the more difficult part is because you have to analyze all those if automatically is when you have multiple season that can be up to three in the tropics in, in Vietnam. So when you adapt those algorithms, then you can create maps. And those maps, this is north of Italy. Okay. Every year, we can make a maps. Okay, that give you the variability of the sowing date and the variability of the heading date. Here, those are overall statistics for all the area. You can see there are some here that are anomalous. Those is the famous 2003, which was a heat wave, very, very, very uh, warm in Europe. And it faster the, the, the development of the crop. So you see how different is, uh, no, sorry, is here. Yeah how earlier is with respect to the other. And here, how late with respect to the other here, because the sowing was really delayed due to a lot of uh, uh, spring uh, um, rain. So what you can do with this, you will see you can use for estimate uh, dynamic crop calendar or to making seasonal uh, information for monitoring system like the one on Mars of GRC. So they make the bulletins and those bulletins say, oh, the season is going well or no, uh, it's, it's not going well because we have a delay in the sowing, so we are expecting that something is uh, occurring uh, badly later in the season. Okay, so th those are the main message why we do that at the regional scale. And what we use at regional scale, in that case, it was modest data. It could be Sentinel-3 now, okay? So it was moderate resolution information. When we have to pass to, to farm level, we have to use other data. So here, an example that we use, it was interesting because we use LAI map 
from different sensors. So from, from uh, Landsat and from Sentinel. So we have a multi-source sensor that creates maps. So we have all those map, uh, LAI information, 26 uh, images between 10 and 30 meters. So it means that at farm level, at field level, that have a frequency of seven day. So it's really, really um, precise in time. They arrive from a radiative transfer model algorithm. So when we have, for each single field, this information, again, we can extract these phenometrics, okay? So when it was the minimum value, it means the, 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 the field is still bare soil. Then we get the increasing LAI, so we can see, okay, it is the emergence. <clears throat> we can have relative metrics, like, like I told you before. When we have the 10% of those increase, when you have the first derivative, it means the first positive. So those are all metrics that we wanted to connect to what is observed in the field. So when the sowing, when the emergence, when the tillering, and when the flowering, okay, at the beginning of flowering and the flowering, when the maturity occurs. And of course, then we can derive other information that is the length of the season, okay? So I have to skip one part because it's late. No, not that late. At the end, when we map for each single field, we can see when it was flooded, when it was sown. I mean, those are estimation. But then it's really important because we can do field by field. So on a regional area, we can have parcel by parcel those kind of information. We uh, validate those information with data, data from field, data from model, model that you remember before when I was describing the system we use in Italy, that there was a model that you can give the sowing date and the variety, at it, and it forecast you the phenological uh, estimates, okay? So we, we, we validate also with those kind of models. And we have some metrics of error in terms of day of the year that we develop. So some, some features are more difficult. We have an error about two weeks. Other are pretty well, like the, 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 the flowering, so in, in one week. In general, we have 10 days of error. But what is the message to, to, for, for this kind of application? Is that if we have a farm, okay, and you look at the farm, rice farm in Italy, how many different variety you have, okay? And those different varieties are genetically different, but also managed in a different way. The same farm, you can, so the rice in at about the DOI 100, it means January, February, March, or in June. So almost 45 days after. So it means there's a, young, a, a great variability. So in terms of monitoring or regional monitoring, you should know if this variability occurs. At a moderate resolution, you will never see that because all those information are mixed up together in the mixture while at the Sentinel resolution, you can really appreciate. And this map that you see are the one that we developed by remote sensing, analyzing the leaf array index time series. And we pick up clearly the difference in the sowing at the tillering stage, but also, that is really nice, the difference at, in the length of the season. Why that? Because the different variety have also a different cycle. Usually, the long, Wrong cycle variety are sowing earlier in order to be in time for the season, while the short one are sowing later. So this information here can be used also not only as, a, as you see for a crop mapping method, but also for at least uh, uh, even more to try to recognize the, the, the type of variety, the, the type of cultivar you are cultivating. And if we see the detection of the tillering, I mean the DOI, when it was estimated tillering, we see that there is a clear difference between late long cycle variety with respect to the short cycle and the middle one. And of course, if we consider the season length, we see the same condition. Those are the short cycle and those are the long cycle. But this is mean that we could in terms of monitoring point of view, provided at the parcel level 
an, uh, um, an estimate of phenolog phenological stages and the proxy of which cultivar is cultivated. So the message here is more to related again to someone to, have, uh, to manage uh, landscape or do monitoring, not to the farmer. It's not very useful to, take, to say to the farmer, oh, your plants, you are planting that variety there. You already know that, okay. But it's more for, for monitoring or for authority to have this mandate. Okay, I went a bit quick but because we will see this afternoon this, uh, with exercise. The main message that I wanted that you give is with the, the temporal series or of a VI or a leaf array index, we are able to detect specific point, at those specific point are related to the, manager, the management sorry, of the, the crop and the physiology of the crop. So those information are useful for doing crop monitoring, okay? Again, you, you will have all the reference there. So the last part of, if you, do you have any question about those? Okay. Okay, the last part of the lesson in the last 40 minutes is related to the yield forecast. Uh, Pierre asked me uh, to, to provide you information on, uh, on phenometrics. This is because this is important for the yield forecast and this is important also because you will see this afternoon. So what I, what the objective for yield forecast, uh, again, can I ask you how many of you is doing in this activity yield forecast or is interested in doing yield forecast? Okay, can I ask, okay, and can I ask you which kind of approach you are using? Then finalizing. Finalizing which one is whether it is remote sensing DC, it's going to pick up its in the statistics or uh, weather based or this uh, actual drop cutting The other? No, we don't understand nothing. Ah, yes, sorry, you're right. <laughs> yeah, the colleagues say that is brief. Hello. Actually, uh, in India, uh, this or Ministry of Agriculture, Mahalanavis National Crop Forecast Center is responsible for yield and acreage estimation. Uh, this is, uh, we are doing yield estimation for me eight major crop and covering almost 90% of the crop acreage. So for this, uh, we are using three, four, four major method. We are using some, we have developed a few empirical models that is uh, completely based on the remote sensing based indices. This, that is NDVI, NDWI, leaf area index and all. Uh, apart from that, we have also using separate empirical model using uh, weather database. We are using rainfall, temperature, relative humidity and all. Uh, other than this, we are using two, three crop simulation model. We, we have our indigenous model that is info crop and we are using DSAT, Ceres crop model, EPSIM and all. Uh, to just to confirm this, our forecasted yield value, we'll do few crop cutting experiment. Uh, uh, we are using this satellite data for the planning of crop cutting experiment. But in operational mode, we do at least one million crop cutting experiment in a year to validate the, our statistics apart from this technology part. Okay. So this is Okay, someone else you want to, to add this uh, experience? Uh, I only want to see what we did in Ghana, like uh, we use uh, beside the weather data and also the remote sensing data, we also collect data about the farm practicing like adding fertilizers or weeding on with machine learning, we was able to predict or uh, uh, forecast the yield. Yeah. Okay. So external data and the machine learning to, to extract the rules for predicting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, right now, I'm, uh, we are using uh, data assimilation techniques to 
uh, similar uh, uh, sentinel to uh, imaginary uh, into our crop model to to do the crop uh, estimation and by the with the drive from the new metric prediction, we can get the yield uh, forecast in during the season. Okay. So the colleague here say someone else. No. Okay. Just wanted to keep just to extrapolate some An empirical way and um, and. Um, and a more sophisticated one, but again based on data driven and the simulation in a crop model. So just, I'm just asking that because those are the category I was explaining here. So I will uh, go uh, through that just to give you an idea of what, what is available. So the empirical one means that you do a relationship between ground yield survey sample, okay, and remote sensing the right parameters. Those remote sensing the right parameters are many, but mainly they are in the concept that uh, in the temporal dimension of the data, the VI data, or the maximum VI or LIFAR index, or the integral in time, you have a proxy of the biomass developed, and the, the proxy of biomass developed is a proxy of the final yield, okay? So those are the most simple one that have a root in the late 80s in, in the study of the, the, the father of remote sensing of agriculture. That you have those reference there. I don't know you need any more of those reference, but are, have to be mentioned because they put the basis for everything. So they are Tucker, uh, Pinter, <coughs> and Dautry. But because those systems have a limit, have a local validity, and are limited, limited applicability in the condition where you develop that. But as you see, they have also a, 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 a great advantage. In fact, are using operationally in some countries because they are simple and effective. So this is the reason why in recent years, thanks to, to, this is the basis, I mean, in the 80s, but thanks to the new satellite, the Modis era and now the Sentinel era, it is possible to produce monitoring system based on this simple concept as uh, the colleague from India have done. And this is done also at the international level. The Geoglan group do that. And there are two important work, one of um, Imbal Bekereshev and from Frank, that they using the maximum NDVIs from the MODIS or a maximum NDVI complemented with growing degree day to do this uh, uh, estimation empirical. Just to briefly understand for who is not doing that, the colleagues are doing that. This is an example reported I'll give you this link at the end. It's uh, nice because it's on the web. It's a report made by, by FAO of the crop yield forecasting system. So you have all the example in, in several countries. This is just to mention the empirical one. It could be the Indian one, but I, I mentioned in the, the China one. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the, the main idea is that you have to do a processing of the data. The important thing is that for the specific crop, because if it is empirical, it means that you have to do for wheat, you have to do for corn, you have to do for rice, okay, or for soya, bean, or whatever. So you have first to extract the NDVI signal in this case, so you need a, a crop mask. And this is the reason why you, a lot of you work on crop mapping, not just for the statistic, but for creating also the mask. The mask. Then you extract time series as you smooth that, and when you have the seasonal NDVI, you can accumulate on the season. When you accumulate on the season, then if you have historical crop production statistics, the colleagues say there, one million you have of per year. Uh, actually, for uh, statistics, uh, sorry. For this statistics generation, we took at least uh, one million crop cutting experiments. Uh, for, but, but, but for crop experiment, uh, uh, crop insurance purpose, we took at least 25 million crop cutting experiment in a year. Those are numbers from India. Yeah. I don't know if another country yeah. have the same, but the concept is they have field data and statistics to yeah. do what? To make a stepwise regression, I mean, a regression analysis between the cumulate parameter in this case and DVI and the Y, that is the yield from those statistics. And then you can predict the yield. The China system, what does it do? It do a refinement. So this is the first um, uh, prediction. And then it check with the observer ground sampling. 
not, I, didn't, I don't think that numbers, but could be because it's China. Yeah. And then if the accuracy of the checkered one is okay, they use those um, uh, model already set up to predict the seasonal yield. Otherwise, they introduce other factors, also from remote sensing or from meteor meteorological one. So refine a new calibration regression analysis to perform new investigation. The message from here are two. You need the input that is come from remote sensing, and you need output to be calibrated that is the statistics and the one that come from the field. Okay. In the, in the, in the uh, material, there is another example, I don't show it here, that show how you can improve that, that instead to do the integral of NDVI from one day to another, you do that an adaptive integral according to what? What we see before. If I, location for location, if I detected the sowing and the maturity, the integral is not fixed in a determinate region about a calendar, but it's dynamic according for what we did, what we say before. Why is dynamic? Because the sowing can be dynamic, and so the signal can be changed, and it reduces a lot the uncertainty in the motor. The second approach, it can be the radiate transfer. Again, it's called semi-empirical, but it has a basis, a physiological basis. Because Montit, okay, the Montit approach, he uh, assess that the net primary productivity, I mean, how much is the dry matter that you produce in a season, is uh, directly related to the APR, the absorbed photosynthetic radiation multiply by a factor that convert those radiation absorbed into dry biomass. On the basis of this, this is a very clever, simple equation because to calculate a par, what you need is a par is the absorbed radiation. Okay, so you need radiation. This can come from meteorological station. And the part of absorbed is due to the plant, to the canopy of the plant, and F a par, that is a, a, a biophysical variable that can be retrieved by remote sensing. So if you multiply the radiation that comes from meteorological data by F apart, you can have the apart. So what they, did, what they discover, that the gross primary production, gross it means before the respiration of the plant that then determine the, the, the net primary production, is, can be derived from apart and from some efficiency coefficient. These efficiency coefficients are the capacity of the different plant to transform the absorber radiation into biomass that have to be modulated by the limiting factor. Because you have a potential capacity of the plant, then you have limiting due to temperature. You are not in the, in the ideal temperate condition, uh, heat wave or uh, cold, cold spell. Or you can have water problem water shortage that reduce the capacity of the plant, the theoretical to the plant. So this is, at the end, a simple way in which the remote sensing part that comes is to the FAPAR. Okay, all the terminology you have here, so I, I skip it, just I wanted to give you the, the, the flavor. The flavor is that the yield can be provided by an harvest index. That harvest index is a concept that in agronomy say, is the part of the total biomass you produce that it represents the, uh, the harvest one, the interest one, the grains, okay, in terms of the, uh, if you are interested to grains, okay. So how is calculated by defining the harvest index and the radiation efficiency, that is the capacity of the plant, the specific capacity of the plant to convert in, in dry biomass, okay. They have a part that arrive from remote sensing. And you see, you modulate, you accumulate that from the start of the season and maturity that can arrive from remote sensing. This is the reason why we were speaking before about the phenometrics, okay? Multiply by something that comes from meteorological information. In this case, radiation and temperature limitation. So in case of my PhD, so it was uh, many years ago, hum up the, the dry matter of rice in this area. Then according to <coughs> knowledge of the different cultivar existing, for each administrative unit we map also the yield, the final yield. And we compare with the statistic and it was 
enough good because the uh, maximum uh, MAA, the uh, maximum absolute error was less than one hectare and the relative error was about 50%. Why I'm mentioning this? Because this is also operational. For instance, the Copernicus initiative is producing this kind of product, okay? And this kind of product can be dry matter product, can be downloaded and use it. Then you can experience if it is available or not. <clears throat> it is used in Africa in particular for savanna and rangeland monitoring. Often it's not used in a quantitative way because you need to calibrate, but it weighs in a qualitative way for C anomaly in the production. Okay, so the last point is the simulation in the crop models. So we saw empirical, <coughs> we did the data, <coughs> we put the data together. The same empirical, there is some physiological basis behind the capacity of the plant to absorb radiation, so we can estimate a proxy of production. And then there is the crop model. The crop model in a nutshell for who's not experiencing crop model is a way to, given this, the meteorological characteristic, given the crop characteristics, given soil map and management, scientists develop models that are able to simulate the plant growth, the specific plant growth in a specific condition. So those are very effective. They were born to understand the physiology of the plant. Then in the 80s, this, the, some, some scientists decide, oh, if I am able to reproduce the physiology of the plant, I can use it that to, to, to support the decision. Because if I change the decision, I can see what's happened to the plant. And in the 19, <clears throat> what was important is that someone else say, okay, if you are able to, to reproduce the, 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 the plant behavior, so you can do also yield forecast. So I have to go fast. Okay, no, 10.30. Okay, I, okay, it's finished. So, <laughs> so we have just to see that we can ingest remote sensing information, okay, in the model. And to do that, we can reduce the uncertainty the model express, so better provide yield estimates. This can be done in different way. Why here in example for what they do, the colleague of Louvain. So using the green area index to modulate, okay, specifically, spatially, the uh, <coughs> model parameter. Okay, so instead of the model parameter that were fixed, they provide a different uh, information for spatially distributed. So they were able to produce maps of uh, uh, production that are tuned thanks to the green area index that is provided by satellite. And in general, what they, what they saw is that they improve uh, the um, estimates three times, and two times was equal, and one was um, even worse. So I skip the part and I leave just one, the last one, that here is the one related to, the, the material you will have there is related to yield forecast system. For one reason, okay, we, we spoke about the, the empirical, okay, we spoke about the, the Montita approach and the, the yield forecast, the, sorry, the, the simulation in, in crop model. But the yield forecast system is much more, much more complicated. This is an example of what in, in Mars in Europe has been done. So the estimates is done by a statistical relation of several indicators. Indicators that are from the meteorological solution, from the modeling, okay, from the Earth observation information. So again, at the end, what is produced is the hill forecast, taking into account which is the trend, the technological trend, I mean the, the increasing of the production due to technological increasing, or the agrometeorological modeling and the remote sensing. Those are all integrated together, and thanks to about 15, 13 years of information, they produce estimates. So it's more or less how the colleague from India they were expressing. How we can improve those? We can improve those providing, again, satellite information to the model, crop mask again, <coughs> phenology, because it helps the model to run in a different way for the different location, and ingesting GLIFARA index. 
So when we do that, <coughs> our multilinear regression of our system is, here is the statistical, official statistical, and here are the indicators that come out from the model. Some of them are forced with uh, remote sensing information. When you, when you have calibrated that, then you can apply for the next year predicting. So this is an example, the last two slides. <coughs> so that's all the official statistics for an area in Spain. And this is what the model estimates. So they are doing the same trend, but they are not the absolute value. So when we ingest the remote sensing data, you see that the, the, the triangle are much more closer. And when we do the post-processing, we see that we can fit exactly with the, exactly, um, very close to the feature statistic. Then this has become the model to predict the estimate. And this is just an example I wanted to show you, and this is the last one. Then we can do what means forecast, that you want to predict the yield before the end of the season. Then you can do that in July, for instance, in a summer crop that is harvested in October or in September, bef just before the harvesting. Of course, you have to create models that are different. And the red cross here is an estimation. It's not observed yet. So it's estimated what will be the forecast in the current season. Just I wanted to show that when we had the remote sensing data, the model, the multi-criteria model, the multi-variable model, selected the forced uh, green leaf array index and the forced yield as the variable most important to predict the yield, okay? With the very good estimates at the end of the season, okay? In summary, and then we close, here the empirical models that I told you can have, are based on proxy, biomass proxy, can be improved with crop uh, seasonality provided by remote sensing. The pro is that are simple, but they have limited applicability. But as you say, in the real condition, in real system, they are used a lot. The same empirical approaches, the one of Montit, are a, a step forward. Again, they produce indicator, and those indicators are used in, in, uh, in forecast system and in early warning system in Africa, for instance. The crop model are really good but the pros that uh, they should represent the reality, and the reality means that you need input in that, and remote sensing can provide the right input to give the information of the season and how it is variable in the, in the different area. And in, at the end, the yield forecast system are a complex system that use all those things together to derive statistics and are improved when crop model is not, when, sorry, when remote sensing is not used also like an external source of information, but when it is ingested in the top <coughs> model. Okay, thanks, and sorry for the delay. Yeah,